This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're live, and it's uh, it's uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm Jay Fidel. We have a special show. This is a special show with one of our special guests who came down to participate in uh, the Clean Energy Day uh, conference that took place uh, earlier this week. So uh, this show is Hawaii State of Clean Energy, and our title is What Can We Learn from the University of Wisconsin on Smart Transportation? And uh, uh, logically, uh, we're going to talk to somebody from the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> and he's the director of the State Smart Transportation Initiative at the University of Wisconsin, and he is Eric Sundquist. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you. Thanks Great for having me. Here. Yeah. So what an excitement. You came here, down here with Craig Dirksen of, Port of Portland. You guys were both uh, material contributions to our effort on Monday. Thank you. And uh, we heard a lot from you. We talked with you. You answered our questions. You were engaged in a, a really good conversation that lifted the value of the program and the importance of the program. But I wanted to review that with you, or re relive it, if you will. Um, and I wanted to get your thoughts now, just the two of us, just alone here, um, about, about how it went for you. What did you think of the proceedings? What did you think of the, you know, the co collective lesson of the day? So first, um, let's talk about what it is at the State uh, Smart Transportation Initiative in the University of Wisconsin. Yeah, so we've been around since 2010. Um, we grew out of a research center at the UW. Uh, we're now co-housed with Smart Growth America in D.C., so we're jointly operated. Uh, but we work with state DOTs around the country, including Hawaii DOT mainly, but we work with some other large entities and some smaller ones too, but mainly state DOTs. Um, we work on sustainability issues. We work on um, modernizing practice and policy, and those two are different things. Often we have great policy goals. We're going to reduce VMT or, or I should explain what that is, and I guess we can in a bit, emissions, uh, we're going to get people to work better and so forth, but the practice, it's hard to change the practice, the decisions that are actually made. Um, so we work a lot on practice. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, let's talk about the payload on this. So you're in the University of Wisconsin, where is that, Madison? It is. And, um, and then you're actually speaking to the whole country. Uh, you're consulting with them, offering them advice, uh, writing papers, consulting in one way or another. Um, and it's not, limited, it's not limited to Madison or the university or to the state of Wisconsin, right? No, and most of our work is outside of Wisconsin. We have not gotten much traction with the, with the yeah, Wisconsin DOT. But you want to be, and you are, a national, a national consulting organization. You're, you're doing university, you know, what do you call it, uh, from academia to industry, from academia to government all over the country. Yeah, so UW has this thing called the Wisconsin Idea that dates back to the Robert La Follette era, where the idea was, the idea, no pun intended, was that the ivory tower shouldn't be a, apart from the world, that people who learn about uh, whether it's engineering or uh, policy or anything should actually be engaged with people who are making decisions in the real world. So we come out of that and we do convenings. So we bring state DOTs to, together for, for meetings. We do technical assistance. So we were here for some other meetings around that uh, in addition to Clean Energy Day. And then we publish and do conferences and stuff, well, regular yeah, we'll academic stuff. So the, the, the payload, the takeaway then, uh, the product of your efforts, it's in events where you speak and participate in panels, I suppose. It's where you publish. And what else? Well, the, most of it is in technical assistance or what you were calling consulting. We call it technical assistance since we're not a for-profit consultant, uh, but it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, okay. Um, well, that's pretty valuable because then you're, you're doing outreach, you're helping people all over, and you're helping us by coming down here. So you came down, you spoke, um, you were a, a, your keynote on Monday. Can you summarize your remarks? Uh, what were you presenting to the crowd at uh, Hawaii Energy, uh, Energy, Clean Energy Day? Yeah, sure. So Clean Energy Day's focus was on transportation, which is why you know, I was asked to speak. Um, and typically when energy people come into transportation, there's a little bit of a, 
I wouldn't say a mismatch, but the, a lot of people in the energy world come from the utility side. That's what they've been working on. Uh, policy around coal plants, policy around utilities. Um, and the transportation policy world is a lot different. What I get out of this, though, I'd be interested in your thoughts about it from where you stand, is that, <clears throat> is that the, the, whole mo the whole movement started out on the energy side. Everybody's interested in better generation, mm -hmm. renewables, you know, moving into the new technologies and all that. And then, just like Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, somebody said, wait a minute, we got to look at transportation because there's so much well, energy. It's the biggest generator of greenhouse gas now. Yeah, right. And, I mean, the grid is getting cleaner, yeah. and transportation is lagging. Yeah. So it's it's you got to look at that. So and it's very sophisticated to deal with energy and transportation. So you look the other side of the fence. You look for somebody you can always sort of meet in the middle. Somebody on the transportation policy side, and you find out those guys are not thinking about energy. Am I right? I, so half right. They are thinking about it, and again, I think a lot of DOTs and states have good policy goals around transportation, that we're going to reduce greenhouse gas by X percent by X year, but it doesn't translate into actions and decisions often in, in practice. So if you go to the average planner engineer and say, we need you to reduce greenhouse gas, they got nothing. There is not... They got stats. They, that's not what, they what they're working yeah, on. Yeah. They're working on should we widen this road because it's congested or should we um, put in another traffic light because there's a danger there? That's what they're trained to do and that's what, they're, that's what all the books in civil engineering around transportation are about. So it's a, there's a disconnect between these policy goals and the practice. And that's, what we were trying to, that's what I was trying to talk about and that's what yeah, we're, yeah. we're working on here with uh, some stakeholders in, around Hawaii. Yeah. So this whole thing about bringing it together, bringing energy and transportation planning together, relatively new, isn't it? Um, and you know, your your uh, smart uh, uh, state smart transportation initiative does include reference to energy because energy is oh, yeah. part of all of that. Energy and, and environmental outcomes in general. So anybody yeah. else uh, at your level, you know, with doing a, an initiative like this in other colleges? Oh yeah, yeah. Now this so. There's a lot of papers written about this. There's a lot of discussion, and there are some actions. I don't want to say that it's just, this is, I thought of this. That's not the case at all. Um, in fact, back 10 years ago, um, or 12 years ago, uh, a lot of us in the Midwest worked on um, a Midwest Governors Association package of, enter, of uh, greenhouse gas reduction efforts. And there was a huge emphasis on transportation. So, but, it's a more diffuse policy target and a practice target than the more centralized utility uh, right. world. So right. we've been thinking about that as such, focused on that for a long time. But this, we haven't really integrated it with all the technology and all the energy aspects of it. And I was very impressed, for example, in your use of technology to determine, what was it, uh, access, accessibility. So you take a, a, given, a given neighborhood, a given community, and you look at, each each destination as against every other destination right. and you determine accessibility through transportation um, and it's, it's actually a very complex matrix it's almost infinite to have all these places connected with all these other places and do uh, accessibility for all of the all of the, the connections it's complex but you know what we got computers they can do that it's not that complex it would would have been this has been written in papers for for two generations now. This is not a new concept. But the computing power and the big data that we have now and make it a make it practice ready. So I mean what the the point of that was when you look at transportation, we basically have three legs of the stool when we're talking about greenhouse gas. We have what are the vehicles? Um, how efficient are they basically? What are the fuels? So even if the car is efficient, there are different uh, carbon intensities in in gasoline, say. You have to analyze each different mode. Yeah, so well, walking is a zero G GHG mode. That one's easy. Yeah, <laughs> uh, transit has some, but I, by and large, we're talking about um, automobiles. And they, you can improve the uh, auto carbon footprint by having more than one person in the car at a time. But anyway, we're, we're looking at vehicles and fuels, and then the third leg of the stool, which is where infrastructure and planning and all the stuff we work on come, up, come in the most is vehicle miles traveled or VMT that I referred to mm -hmm, before. Mm -hmm, yeah. So 
normally what we do is we look at congestion and delay and those sorts of things and those tell us what to go and put money into or to improve or to expand. But if you look at accessibility, um, what it, it does a number of things. One, it describes what people really care about most getting out of transportation. It's not that important how fast I go if I can get where I'm going quickly. So if my destinations are close together, then maybe I can uh, slower vehicle speed or I can even get out and walk or something and, and be there. So and I can make a plan. <clears throat> I can plan to go this way and not that way. I can make a plan to use this, this mode and not that mode and get there faster. Right, so you can look at the different modes in one paradigm, so which is different than the traditional how fast are we go in mode because there's different standards for walking and different standards for, there's, I mean, there's really not a how fast can I walk mode uh, uh, standard at all. Well, but if for traffic cars is and, completely and congested right, right in the next block and people are spending 20 minutes moving five inches, yeah. um, walking is faster. It can be. So, so the point of, if we look at different modal accessibilities, which you described well, it's just like how easily can I get from where I am to the potential opportunities that I might want to go visit. Well, that could be a job, it could be a school, it could be a grocery store, it could be another house, uh, it could be whatever. Um, if I look at that across all four modes, bike, ped, transit, and car, I can get a really good idea how much people are going to drive. Because if all you can do is drive, if everything is inaccessible except by car, then people are just going to drive. Yeah. And then when I know that, my planners and engineers have some traction. They can say, let's raise up the accessibility on the other modes. We can make some land use decisions. We can make some transportation decisions. And we can see empirically that where accessibility is higher by walking, say, BMT, vehicle miles traveled, go down, and emissions go down. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden we have something that practitioners can use as the point. Let's talk about technology, or at least improvement. You know, take a system as exists. You want to improve accessibility, uh, reduce vehicle miles traveled. So you have to make changes. I mean, for example, and I'm only speaking of Honolulu now, I stop at the traffic light, yeah. and I wait for three minutes or four, and I notice that nobody is crossing uh, vertically. I mean, nobody. There is no other traffic there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I say, gee, couldn't they do better? Couldn't they have sensors, you know, that determine there's no other traffic coming and, 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 and free me up to cross the intersection earlier than three minutes? I'm killing time, I'm killing money, I'm killing everything um, by just sitting there for all that time. So, you know, arguably, if you put in some sensors and put in some technology, I'm improving my accessibility in that mode on that street, going to that destination. So that's got to be part of the planning, doesn't it? Uh, also, let me throw one more thing in. If, if you find that the street is not adequate to get there, uh, that you need another street, an alternative street, this happens much, a lot, a lot of time in, in Hawaii with the, the valleys and the, um, you know, the cuts through the mountains and so forth, where you have one, one road only. Something happens on that road, everybody gets tied up. Happens all the time. So you say to yourself, well, let's use some condemnation here. Uh, let's make a second road. Let's, let's have a, a, some relief from the you know, total dependency on one road, and that's got to be better. So I'm just throwing that in as a, a, a possible alternative improvement that you would make in order to make life better. Sure. So, yeah, so we're talking about automobile access now, accessibility. Yeah. And your first point is absolutely dead on. Often when we think about problems with accessibility, whether, by any mode, we think about we got to build stuff. But operating the system that already exists, you know, the foot within the same footprint, can be very efficient. And, and uh, so whether it's signalization improvements or transit route improvements, mm. uh, signalization improvements for pedestrians. I mean, I've yes. stayed here near the beach and, and spent a lot of time waiting for lights to change walking around in the past three or four days. So, so we, have, we have a very high rate of pedestrian fatality, by the way. Yeah, and, and the, which could be resolved with improved signals. More signals sometimes there, and there's a variety of different kinds. So there's a lot of sometimes when you have long blocks, um, it's really impractical for the pedestrian to walk all the way down, cross, and then walk all the way back. And they they it's they call it jaywalking, but it's really kind of unfair because it's it's just the pedestrian doing what is 
efficient. I do it all the time, you know. And In fact, I would venture to say that every time I walk, you could arguably say it's jaywalking. Yeah. So uh, the, let's take a oh, geez, all right. Okay, gotcha. 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 all right. Took me a minute. <laughs> That's Eric Sundquist. He's the director of the State Smart Transportation Initiative at the University of Wisconsin, serving the whole country. And we'll be right back after this short break to further discuss what can be done in Hawaii. We'll be right back. This guy look familiar? He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go! Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here with Eric Sundquist. He's the director of the State Smart Transportation Initiative at the University of Wisconsin. We're delighted to have him here. And we're, our title of the show is, uh, what, what uh, let's see, what, what can we learn? What can we learn from the University of Wisconsin in smart transportation? And guess what? Sharon Moriwaki <laughs> is here. She's the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Good to she be put here. that program out on Monday. She's going to tell you a little about it and, and Eric's role in the larger yeah. picture of that program. Well, you know, we've been, we've been grappling with transportation, clean transportation, energy and transportation for so long. Uh, and so clean energy, pathways to clean transportation was the uh, theme for, for Monday's Clean Energy Day. And, uh, we wanted to do something different. We wanted to not only bring experts like Eric in, but also have them listen and listen to people who are doing things in the state and putting that all together and actually themselves coming to consensus on what kinds of goals do we want to take forward. And so um, we really appreciated Eric's role on measuring success in clean transportation. And part of uh, the problem sometimes is that you have goals and you don't have measures. And so they stay on the books and stay on the shelf. That's called that's pie in the sky. <laughs> pie in the sky. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it, it doesn't get done. You yeah. know, I guess they say you, you only do what you measure. And so we really appreciated Eric's coming over, not only to speak to us, but to work with the people who really do need to make things happen and can make things happen are the transportation folks. So he was with transportation planners and with, um, with people that we don't usually see on the energy side of the house. 
Yeah. So um, it, he's making that connection for us because he has a background in, in energy, yeah. but also working with transportation. It's the integration of energy yeah, and, and that's transportation. that's what we're looking at, yeah. integration, collaboration. And as the mayor said the other day, right, is you not only sing to the choir, you expand the choir. And how can we bring people to work shoulder to shoulder, which is what we did on Monday to come up with goals and actions. So yeah. we're trying to get a report out and we've been working hard on that. <laughs> so you, you not only two. spoke in the keynote about what you were doing in the University of Wisconsin and uh, all the analysis you were making, the computer models you were making, but you also actually consulted with some people while you were here. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So we um, are working with HDOT over the next several months on this, or maybe up to a year. That's the Hawaii Department of Transportation, Sorry State about Department. That. <laughs> uh, and the counties. And the counties, but, but, too. Right. So we're working with HDOT, though, on specifically on some follow-up to a previous workshop um, that looked at scoping transportation projects and some, some um, better practices for them. And it's sort of now attached that effort to what we talked about on Monday at Clean Energy Day. So we had counties and AMPO, the MPO for, for Oahu, um, and HDOT in a workshop for two days talking about, again, performance measures. Um, how do we measure decisions or our, apply measures to decisions that we're making so that we point in the right direction and not the wrong one and, and bring energy and other, other considerations into uh, these decisions that haven't been there before. So what, how did you feel about it? I mean, were, were the agencies you're talking with, were, were they coming to action points here? Um, give us an, an, an honest appraisal. Yeah, so they, they, the counties are in different places, in some, which you would expect. I mean, Oahu and Kauai are vastly different in scale. Um, yet uh, the energy was universally really good across all of the islands and and with the state and the MPO, they requested this. So this is something they requested. That we, yes, yeah, so this wasn't something that we were coming and trying to sell. Mm. This was a request. Um, and they've all been working on performance measures and putting them into practice for uh, I know, probably a varying time depending on the, the island. Some are a little further along than the others. So how, how well do you think Hawaii is doing from what you've seen? That's, um, that's an open-ended question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, and it's really hard to answer because um, the, in, there's so many different aspects of transportation. So clearly you have this massive rail project that is um, really important and should, you know, we'll expect that it succeeds. That could, that could be a real game changer here in Oahu. I mean, that could be a real I mean, BMT. Either way if it succeeds or doesn't succeed. <laughs> well, true, yeah, if it doesn't, then that'll be tough too. But generally the, I mean, the, generally the projections on ridership on almost every transit project in the country in the modern era, you know, dating back maybe to the 70s, they always underestimate ridership because of the models. So um, unless something is really different about this, and I'm not really in the weeds on the, the projections and the modeling, um, it should perform really well. And that provides a big opportunity, we were talking about accessibility, to have transportation-oriented development, which the city is big into, um, sometimes intentional, like we're gonna, we have some state-owned land or the city's gonna bring some land together here so we can, we can sort of be developers. Or organically, if you have this, this transit system that is providing new accessibility uh, as a spine, and you can provide walking access to it at many different points, the land users can just respond sort of organically and, and densify in places where you'd like. So what do you favor, planned TOD or organic development? I mean, I don't think you have to choose. I think if you have an opportunity to do some, some if you have state-owned land, which there is a lot in Hawaii, as I understand, then why not like plan that? Uh, on the other hand, you're not gonna be able to do that at every stop or every, station area. So where you're not doing intentional TOD, let's make the organic stuff really work. Let's make the zoning compatible. Let's um, make, make it sure easy. the walking and the routes in and out very mm -hmm. easy. Um, 
And I, I, this isn't any news to anybody in, in the city of Honolulu. I think they were thinking about that. No, but uh, you know, there's so many uh, components to, to, to play together. Um, and I, you know, I see uh, your initiative as um, a place where you evaluate the components and you, you make them work together. Uh, and, you, and you have to give appropriate emphasis and stress on some over others, and that depends on the community involved and what people want and what is available. And, you know, for example, bikes. Bikes that don't do well up steep hills. But bikes do well on, you know, on the, the roads, the main roads around Oahu that are sea level. Um, so query, I just ask a question. What is the future of bikes here? Do you think bikes are promising? Uh, do you think bikes are a, a larger element, a larger element in the development of clean transportation here than they would be in some other place? Uh, I saw a bunch of people out on them last night, uh, particularly the bike share with the flashing lights. Mm -hmm. I understand those are ahead of projection in terms of ridership. Um, uh, I think that there are there's a long way to go in terms of retrofitting the road so that people feel safe to do it. Costs money. It costs money. We, no, it does, doesn't always cost that much money. What it costs is a is a trade off. Like, am I willing to give up some parking spaces so that the bikes can go through here? or a lane of traffic or something like that. So those sorts of hard choices are more of a barrier than the money usually. The money for a bike lane isn't usually very How much. do you make these choices in a perfect world? In a world where you know you have seen it would be most efficient, how do you make those choices politically, um, community-wise? How do you make those choices? Yeah, it really depends. Uh, it, it's, it's a messy process when it gets to community that people have you know, their own set of beliefs and their own interests. Um, some people's interests may track right against having a bike lane because they have a store on the street and they are certain that if people can't park there, they, cars. they will not come to the store anymore. Now, that may not be true. So the one linking thing is that you can, you, and we work in academia and consulting, is to bring as much information to the table as possible. So at least if there's going to be this political... Uh, messy discussion that you know honestly doesn't always turn out for the for the best. Um, it's, but you, you want to you make want sure the they understand the implications and effects yeah, of making so it can, this way or that way. You can at least tamp down some clearly irrational or un, unfounded um, claims. Mm -hmm. so uh, others said, are just have policy decisions. Experiences like in Hawaii where people love their automobiles and how do you transfer from that love of automobiles to helping to everybody share the road to get to where we want to go faster or better? Uh, how, how, ha, has any other jurisdiction gone from that point to, to uh, sharing the road? Yeah, they have. Um, there are some famous cases in, um, in Washington, D.C. and New York. Um, when I lived in the D.C. area in the 80s, you could drive anywhere and park anywhere. There were no bikes. The transit system was not used a lot. Um, and now the uh, modal share of people traveling in, in Washington is mostly not by car. And there's not really that much congestion at, in the district per se. Now, when you get to the suburbs, it's epic congestion because that's still very car-oriented. So, um, and some of that was land uses being built close together so people could walk and that you didn't have to drive. Some of it was um, infrastructure, so they have counterflow bike lanes. Um, they have uh, added to the capacity of transit um, and so forth. So mm -hmm. it's both sides of the coin, the land use and the transportation. And we don't, you know, we try not to like chastise people for driving. And that doesn't help anything, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. some people have a really good reason to have to drive. They just, you know. Any they, number of reasons. Yeah. Right? And I drive some. I mean, I'm not like anti-car. Um, I, you know, try to balance it out. But um, if we give people the opportunity to drive less, driving is a cost. If we give people the opportunity to drive less, a lot of people will do that. And that's really the goal. So, and then they get off the road, so maybe. you have to create that infrastructure so you have that option, that convenience. Yeah and that, you know, gets you where you want to go without cost. And, and you or, you know, I may still drive, but so, there's a, a, you know, a continu continuum of people, and some people will stop driving readily and some will do it 
with a little more mm -hmm. incentive and yeah. so forth. Talk about infrastructure we're remaking. This, your initiative, and like initiatives, and maybe what happens here in Hawaii, uh, remaking the society, the country. Because uh, somebody said on Monday that 50% of the land area in a given city is dedicated to transportation, 50%. That, including parking. parking. Yeah. Including parking, parking is the big one. 50%. And you know, when you think about it, the economy of the country is largely in the cities. Right. The population is largely in the cities, and how the cities work mm -hmm. is sort of a metric on how the how the country works. And so we've got to use those public spaces. And I, I say public spaces advisedly. You know, I, but you know, your apartment in your condo or my house, it's not a public space. But everything else is a public space. The city flows mm -hmm. through these public spaces, and I don't think we've paid enough attention in the past few years. While the community gets more active, has more to do, we all have more to do, more places to go. We're used to that. Like the old days with the car. It was a car only, you mentioned a little while ago. You know, right. um, it was not happening as fast. People were not doing as much. Now they're doing more. They've got to get around. And that's good. The economy, you know, quality of life, you've got to get around. And so we have got to catch up with that, in my view. I'm interested in your view. And we've got to make, you know, public spaces that work better. And these are... Transportation is all about public spaces, and that means we're remaking our structure, our infrastructure in the community, and indeed we're remaking our cities, and indeed we're making remaking our lives. A whole thing is in transformation, and, and when you add to that, at the same time in parallel, we're remaking our energy generation systems. You know, could this be a better time to be alive, or could it be a worse time to be alive? <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll What's see. your comment, Eric? Well, you're right. I mean, there, it is the transportation infrastructure is vast and not appreciated because so much of it is parking, and which is, and it falls in different silos. So the Department of Transportation doesn't own the parking; they don't really think that much about it. The people who own parking don't really own the roads, and uh, and then there's local roads and there's state roads, and so there's a bunch of silos, and it's hard to bring it all together. But there are great signs of that happening. So, the, you know, it used to be in the U.S., the walking environment was just a social safety net. It was there if somebody absolutely had to, but the assumption was everybody else probably would drive, except in a few dense cities where there was still transit. And now we know that we can make those, those areas livable. Those are places, not just conduits. Those are places, and if people linger there or if they're, they, uh, you know, shop there, or, or that's part of their living space because it's, it's, you know, a place where they can meet their neighbors because it's a nice environment mm -hmm. instead of just a conduit again. Um, it, you know, at one point, we, our house was full of all hallways and shrunken little disconnected rooms, so we got to make the rooms, these places that were hallways, into kind of rooms again. And there's always going to be some fast-moving, you know, regional facility that isn't going to be that much fun to, like, hang out on the side of the road mm -hmm. and be on, right? But we can make all the rest of the stuff much better. Better quality of life, better quality of city, better economy. The whole thing is better. I mean, do you like your work? Yeah, very much. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> I guarantee one thing, it's going to get more interesting as more people realize these, these processes. And you know what's going to make it really interesting in about four or five years or even sooner is autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. Further complication. That changes Major complication. a lot. That's another disruptor. Mm -hmm. So that nobody knows quite how that's going to go. Is it going to be, are people going to like buy them and own them privately and then decide, I can live way out in the country because land is cheap and it's pretty and I'm going to spend all day driving back and forth and then we just have... We use more energy. <laughs> more emissions go through the yeah. roof, and, and you, we have rivers of metal that make everything unlivable along the conduits. Or is it more of a shared mobility transit model where you, you have um, electric vehicles and lower, lower emissions, more mobility, including for people who don't have mobility now because of income or disability or what have you or age. Um, so it'll probably be some mix. But policy and practice are going to play right oh, into that. Hard problem. Some kind of regulation. <laughs> and, yeah, that, regulation, right? government action. It's, right. it's really Safety. a million things Incentives. all feeding in. And it's critical. It's critical to our lives and our future uh, by community and by, and by nation. But <clears throat> we're almost out of time. So I, I want to ask you one last area, and sure. that is 
Um, what's your future with Hawaii Ne? Um, do you have some lingering contact here? Will you have some lingering? Do you want to have lingering contact here? Uh, how can we find you? Are you coming back? Will you come back to our table? Sharon wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer is yes. We have this work that is funded to work through Hawaii DOT, but also with the counties um, and with the MPO. So I think we're already trying to put something on the books for, our, for January. Please come back. Yes, yeah, we will. Great, because yeah. we need you. Coming back to Hawaii in January from Wisconsin <laughs> makes a lot more sense than coming here in August. There are many benefits. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to tell us where you are so you can give us some feedback yeah, in yeah, January. Yeah. You probably yeah, know. Oh, we'll January. be. <laughs> we're going to have some check-in with with our stakeholders and hopefully have a lot to show by then and a lot to do. Well, thanks on a number of levels for coming down here, for talking with us, for participating in the program and for coming back. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Eric Sundquist. Now, Sharon, you have to close. Okay. Well, we're really pleased to have Eric and people like Eric um, really caring about Hawaii because I think we sometimes have consultants come in, they don't know about Hawaii, and but, but you know, they come in and they tell us how to do things, and I think we're very respectful of what we have and, and consi considered uh, an expert to bring to us what we can glean and really use to our benefit. So we want you to come back, we want to hear from you, and we want to make that connection continue. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for coming down. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Aloha. <laughs>